and then I will interrupt the recording before our discussion. So, here we are. So I will try and propose uh, five principles of philosophical health for critical times. Um, those principles, uh, as some of you will recognize, uh, are not that new. Or in fact, it depends from your evolutionary perspective. They're not that new in the sense that all of them were already articulated in a way or another uh, by Greek philosophers. Uh, however, uh, I don't consider that philosophy and philosophizing in that sense um, is necessarily something old is actually if you if you look at human evolution it's something that is rather new and i argue that uh, the idea of philosophizing and philosophical health philosophizing as uh, a way of life is actually uh, not yet uh, fully integrated by uh, humanity. So it's, it's still a, a project for the future. So the first principle is mental heroism. And indeed, uh, it takes extreme individual courage to think as independently as possible. That's one thing but also to think independently and in a way, as we will see, that uh, is coherent with the way we act. That adds another layer of difficulty. And of course, the idea of mental heroism, as I said before, was already present in uh, antiquity and was somehow reactivated by Kant with his three maxims of practical wisdom, which you can find um, well articulated in uh, his um, anthropology, which is his, one of his last words. Think for oneself, that's uh, quite well known. Uh, think into the place of the other in communication with human beings and always think consistently consistently with yourself. So it's interesting because one might say, well, in a way, the second maxim might be might seem contradictory with the, the maxim one and three, right? Uh, if you always think for yourself and if you always think consistently with yourself, you might think that you actually don't need to think into the place of the other. But I think this second uh, maxim is important because mental heroism is not only about being able to resist uh, resignedly, it's also about, about intersubjective care. And what Kant means here is intellectual empathy. And intellectual empathy is not the same thing as emotional empathy, right? This is uh, quite self-evident. So the idea of philosophy is a concern for the whole. Uh, and in philosophy, that whole is called the universal. Uh, whether we think that the universal is represented by a higher conceptual power, value, idea, and we will see what this might be with principle two, or simply the idea of the whole. Philosophy could be defined as the concern for the whole, while all other activities might be argued they are concerned with a certain domain of experience, a domain of practice or domain of knowledge. And 
So what philosophy is saying is, well, well, if you want to be healthy, whatever you do, you need to think of the whole. You need to think of the place of what you do in the big picture. Right. So that was a, a, a little bit of introduction to uh, this, uh, the first um, principle, which indeed implies that there's a coherence between our orientation in life and our orientation in thinking. And that's the second principle, deep orientation. which is again something that you find, an idea that you find uh, in uh, ancient Greek philosophy. However, it was reactivated, reformulated by um, Ado, who uh, is an historian of ideas, historian of philosophy, who was very um, concerned with the fact that we forgot that philosophy was a way of life. Um, so, the highest courage beyond daily mental liberating exercise is to define and remain faithful to an overarching existential and spiritual horizon that can guide the person towards her highest destiny. So this might seem very ambitious and, and, and I, do, I don't think we can uh, edulcorate the fact that philosophy was appeared as a very ambitious project, right? So it is, it is about uh, heroism and, and higher destiny. Whether one is able to achieve it or simply consider it as a asymptotic horizon, as something to reach for, an ideal, of course, that is another question. And in a way, by way of parenthesis, that is the very meaning of philosophy. Philosophy doesn't mean to claim that they will achieve wisdom it's the love of wisdom is the the longing for wisdom so it's it's a path indeed it's a way a philosophical life orientation means that we think about the future as co a co-created horizon in which the domestic realm and the cosmological realm are in harmony and correspondence and here we see uh, uh, a correspondence with the idea of the universal. This means, what, what does orientation means? Well, it means that we do not pursue uh, several contradictory visions. We might pursue uh, different strategies to actualize the, the highest value that we admire, whether that is truth, good, justice, or, 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 or understanding, or love. Uh, but what this idea of deep orientation means is that we, we are more likely to be coherent if we are consistent. So this, of course, connects to the ideal of human flourishing, the, the Aristotle and eudaimonia, um, from, and by which individuals aspire to free themselves from uncontrolled beliefs, automatic fears, dogmas, impulses, lack of mastery over their personal destination. This is familiar for those of you who are uh, readers of uh, Stoicism, for example. But I want to emphasize the fact that Stoicism is just one modality of, of uh, one, one perspective on uh, what is philosophical health. Right. And so this is not again this as we have seen is not something that is a a selfish care for the self uh, a ivory tower care for the self uh, in fact already since plato philosophy is preoccupied with utopia Pre philosophy is preoccupied with the idea of paradise on earth 
uh, not a another worldly paradise, but the actualization of the values in the everyday life. And how? So this leads us to the third principle, uh, which I term critical creativity. So I was born in 71, and as long as I remember, I heard the media say that we are in crisis. The reasons for the crisis might be different, but as long as I've lived, we've always been in crisis. But what does crisis mean? I think we have also forgotten that uh, the, the etymology, the origin of the term crisis uh, and, and the verb, the Greek term crisis and the verb crenade means to judge, discriminate, choose, decide in an important moment uh, what to do and how to interpret things. And um, if we translate it, is if we translate it uh, uh, correctly according to its root, we have the idea of the winnowing of wanted elements from unwanted material. For example, the notion of crisis was also used in the medical realm by ancient Greeks and Romans. And crisis meant to, to be aware of the crucial moment where the, the, the process, the biological process of the body is going to evolve either towards good, either towards worsening. And so critical creativity means an awareness. Of course, it also means a, a critical in the, in the sense of, of the university, in the sense of examining uh, by ourselves uh, rationally, uh, but this is also present in the first principle. What this principle also adds is that uh, we want to be able to not only determine a situation uh, and analyze it, but also do it in a process that is co-creative. And we will see what, what creative means here. It's creative here doesn't mean uh, necessarily the production of new objects. It, it means, again, for the Greeks, the, a certain attunement with what they called physis, our nature, which they considered as a creative process. Life is constantly presenting new situations to us, which may or may not be defined as critical. We evaluate them through the lens of our worldview and orientation without letting ourselves influenced by statistical anxieties or self-abasement. Right. The fourth and connected uh, principle of philosophical health that I propose is deep listening. So this seems quite um, obvious um, although we don't do it on a daily basis because it's also a practice. And to comprehend philosophically is not only to understand analytically, it is also to engage in dialectic comprehension, a form of dialogue that aims at becoming consonant either with the other, with nature, or with our ideal of truth or authenticity. So this is an engagement in life, an engagement with light of the listener, of the observer and the speaker. And of course, we want to be able to hear the signs that are present in our everyday life or context or in the person that is the other. But we also want to be able to, to practice an awareness to the unheard of. And one of the reasons we are not very good at deep listening is that we 
think we heard it all uh, a lot of times. And we are, we think that listening is to label things. Oh, that's this, that's that. Recognize. Uh, it's not only that, of course. And so this is where, again, this connects with the, the, the principle of uh, physis in Greek. Uh, nature as creative emergence. Uh, this uh, continuous vigilance and presence of mind. It's a constant tension of the spirit. Uh, is connected to the idea that life is both common and so it's a listening to the common that has been forgotten, but it's also a listening to the singularity, singularity in the sense that indeed uh, each phenomenon may be unique. Each person is unique. And the last principle I propose is absolute possibility. And by absolute possibility, I do not mean in neoliberal fashion that yes, everything is possible and technology uh, uh, is uh, going to save us. And by the way, <clears throat> only technology is going to save us and, and the sky is the limit. What is meant uh, in, in the philosophical tradition by absolute possibility is more an a priori horizon. It's precisely what the Greeks called the, the creative chaos or, or, or physics is this idea that, well, we may agree on the axiom that the thought, the source of being is a creative flux of infinite possibility of which we actualize, according to Aristotle, who called it, sometimes it's translated as potentiality, who may be actualized in a way or another. There's nothing fully necessary about a way we actualize a society, a way we react to certain events, etc. It is a choice. It is a, a, a perspective taken on a moment uh, that might or might not be a moment of crisis, that might be a moment uh, that we don't even perceive because it's um, normal, is perceived as regular, like the weather. But in any cases, uh, the axiom of, of absolute possibility is according to me the most generous ontology, ontological hypothesis about the cosmological source of all things. And if you remember first principle, we said that philosophy is a discourse of the whole, is a care for the whole, for the universal, and therefore it has all constantly attempted to propose a name, an idea for that whole. Right? So the idea is not to be dogmatic about this primum mobile, as Aristotle uh, proposed it. I think the idea is to propose it as an ethical and even political concept. What is the absolute that will prevent less dogmatism uh, and perhaps prevent even a form of totalitarianism? I think it's creation, and I've argued that in, in several uh, writings. Uh, in philosophy, you have an important question, which is the question of the real. What is real? What is the real? And so I, I, I call Creel that absolute possibility to point to the fact that it is a creative uh, process of absolute possibility. And the real, it's, it's multiple. It, it's the options that we take when we actualize that um, feeling. Right, so I'll, I'll conclude here. Uh, 
before we uh, discuss together. So I think you all heard, even if it's not your English is not your uh, mother tongue, you all heard the expression get real. There's this idea that the realists are, are, are really the, the, the people who make this world function and fix it. I think that is a, a, um, a wrong perspective on history. Uh, I think that if we look at history, well, we, we observe that many times it is uh, groups or individuals that were attached to this idea of absolute possibility or even something that was perceived as impossibility by the realist who made things evolve. So since we hear a lot this uh, neoliberal um, international monetary fund uh, injunction to get real, um, the injunction of philosophical health is to get real. And, and by that, I mean to try to consider that physical health and, and psychological health as practices of care uh, are not the ultimate horizon of health. And by the way, even these practices were considered in the beginning of the 20th century a privilege for the happy few. Uh, systematic exercise or diets or, or even psychoanalysis, they were um, a luxury for the happy few. And they became, of course, at the end of the 20th, 20th century, a program, uh, even uh, sometimes uh, a biopolitical program, as we see now in our current uh, crisis. So my vision is that philosophical health can also be democratized and cease to be a, a luxury for, for, for the few, which it was also for the Greeks. It was a luxury for the few. But then, and I'll, I'll, I'll end in that uh, note of uh, or s perhaps a self-critical note, well, we have to be aware also that it might be self-contradictory to desire that philosophical health be uh, as institutionalized as physical health, for, for example, or even psychological health, right? And, and there again, uh, the important thing of the idea of um, creolectics that I'm developing in my research is that, well, I believe that this, uh, this perspective is precisely ethical and political in the sense that it, it, it is concerned with preventing a new uh, dogmatism. Uh, the worst thing that would happen to philosophy and, and Plato was very much aware of it, or at least he became aware of it at the end of his life after writing uh, the Republic and more importantly, after trying to apply his political principles uh, to the um, governance of a small uh, city with uh, a tyrant, is that paradise on earth can, if it is imposed, of course, become um, hell on earth. Okay, so the presentation stops here and I will uh, also interrupt the recording.